Well, hello everyone. My name is Justin McFarlane, and thank you for joining our webinar today, Common Refining and Petrochemical Plant Steam Applications Part 2. I want to introduce my co-presenter, Tracy Snow, who is a consultant at TLV Corporation. And today we also have several collaborators working behind the scenes who will be answering any questions you may have during the webinar. And any questions that we don't get to during the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up with you uh, in an email. So before we move to the next slide, and so the rest of the presentation runs smoothly, I'm going to ask that everyone, including myself, to turn off the camera. So today we're going to show you some real-world examples of applications where TLV is being able to identify problems and provide solutions to customers to help mitigate those issues. However, we recognize that what we show you may not reflect how your specific equipment operates, and any solutions we provide may not fully resolve existing problems. So I see, please read our disclaimer here. Now during this webinar, we're gonna talk about how to optimize some different steam using equipment you'll find in a refinery or petrochemical plant. We're gonna talk about vacuum system applications, such as vacuum distillation columns and condensing turbines. Extruders and desuperheaters, as well as several applications within sulfur recovery units. If you want to read some more about steam system optimization, this is a very helpful article written by TLV's Mr. Alan Ho and Mr. Tetsuya Mita, written for Hydrocarbon Processing Magazine. And to supplement that article, you can read about risk based methodology for steam systems written by TLV's Dr. Brian Kane, which discusses risk mitigation relative to API 580 and 581. Both this article and the one we show, shown on the previous slide can be found on our website and, and in the handout section of today's webinar. So TLV typically approaches steam system optimization using a three-tier approach, as I've shown here. But today, we're only going to be talking about steam using applications, specifically to identify incidents and bottlenecks and to optimize performance of assets. I'm pretty confident that no refining or petrochemical plant wants to see things like insufficient vacuum pressures or offset spec uh, from pelletizer. We're having to deal with excessive and constant blowdown downstream of these superheaters or frozen sulfur lines. So now let's take a look at a st typical steam system. But really every site should consider their steam system as their steam heat asset since the system is the primary utility for getting heat to your production processes. Steam is created at a boiler and is sent to the plant using steam distribution network. And the goal here should be to supply dry steam to your process equipment and tracing. I'm going to drain condensed steam fast in order to maximize the heat outputs of the process, and then recover that condensate to maintain efficient operation. Now, to begin our discussion of specific applications, I'm going to turn this over to Tracy Snow to talk about vacuum steam system applications. Thank you, Justin. And as he said, our first topic of discussion is vacuum steam systems. Before we get into specific applications, we should first discuss the primary equipment used for vacuum steam systems, the ejector. The steam jet ejector, or simply steam ejector, is the most essential and critical component of a vacuum steam system. Why is this? In this animation, a high pressure steam flow is passing through a nozzle at high velocity to create a suction force, which pulls in a steam or other gas flow at low pressure, at which point the streams mix to form a mid pressure flow downstream. Proper nozzle design, particularly the diameter, length, and position, is critical to the performance of the ejector. And the greater the driving force of the motor steam through that nozzle, the greater the suction force will be as well. However, motive steam that is of poor quality may result in ejector nozzle and throat erosion, leading to increased steam consumption and reduced vacuum pressure. 
Consider that just a 7% increase in nozzle size due to erosion means a 28% increase in steam consumption and accompanying reduced suction. This in turn can have negative impact on the performance of the process equipment that it is associated with. If there is poor condensate drainage from the steam supply, this can lead to wet steam erosion of the ejector internal, internal components, which would eventually lead to reduced vacuum and ultimately decreased productivity of vacuum equipment. An excellent way that can often help improve ejector performance and reliability is to use a high efficiency steam separator in the supply to the ejector. Certain designs, such as this cyclonic effect separator, have moisture separation efficiencies as high as 98 to 99%. Now, having talked about the importance of ejector operation, let's look at the first of two vacuum steam system applications, vacuum distillation towers. Vacuum towers are typically located in the crude distillation or pipe stills unit of a refinery. For best operation, the tower pressure is usually kept within a strong vacuum pressure range of 10 to 40 millimeters mercury absolute. The goals of this application are to maintain strong vacuum on the tower and optimize the cut point. Here is a basic schematic of a vacuum distillation process where a residual product is piped over from the bottom of the atmospheric tower, heated through a furnace, and then fed into the vacuum tower for distillation. The efficient separation of the various distilled hydrocarbons from the top of the vacuum tower at the very low vacuum pressures required generally requires a train of three steam ejectors and condensers in series. A mode of steam line is supplied to each of the ejectors at one constant pressure. The tower is usually very tall, and the ejectors will normally be located on a platform several feet above the ground. So what do we typically see in the field? Well, there could be several hundred or several thousand feet of piping getting the steam from the boiler over to the unit where the ejectors are located. And it's not uncommon to see that there are few, if any, condensate drainage points located along the bottom of that distribution system as it makes its way over to the ejectors. Then for the steam going up to the ejector platform, it may not be that unusual to see that there's large sections of insulation missing from the piping, which adds to the radiant heat loss of that steam. The steam travels up to the ejector platform, which is oftentimes at least 50 to 60 feet above the pipe rack level. Do you think with these situations that we might have some wet steam going into those ejectors? Or in another situation, steam lines may be dropping down to the ejectors. And in this case, we notice there are no condensate drainage points at these low points either, just before the mode of inlets. Another possibility that there is wet steam going in. So how can this be improved? If we take a best practices piping approach, we would want to install condensate drainage locations or CDLs at proper intervals along the steam distribution system and add a cyclone separator to remove entrained moisture in the steam flow with a sufficiently sized free float drain trap. And also it would be good to add a Y strainer to remove rust scale and other solid debris from the steam flow, as this can be just as damaging to an ejector nozzle as wet steam erosion. The combination of these components will potentially lead to optimized vacuum and improved ejector performance and reliability. Now we will move from distillation towers into our second vacuum steam application, condensing turbines. Turbines. These types of turbines are commonly found in applications where a large amount of driving force from a single unit is required, such as electrical generators, gas compressors, and blowers. For maximum power, the vacuum pressures on the exhaust side should ideally be in the range of 28 to 29 inch mercury. The goals of these applications would be to maximize turbine horsepower and efficiency 
and optimize production. With a condensing turbine, we are extracting a large amount of energy from the high pressure steam supply to produce a high level of horsepower for applications such as generators by exhausting steam to vacuum pressure. The vacuum is created and maintained within a large heat exchanger known as a surface condenser. The condensate that results from the rapid condensing of steam falls into the collection area at the base of the condenser known as the hot well. And the condensate is then piped down to a high capacity condensate pump where it is returned back to the boiler. In order to create and maintain a strong vacuum pressure in the condenser, air must be initially and continuously removed from this condenser. In order to accomplish this, an air exhauster system must be utilized. Now the air exhauster system is essentially comprised of a two-step process. The startup phase where initial air is removed using a large capacity steam ejector called the hogger jet, discharging motive steam and air to atmosphere. And then the normal operation phase where air is shifted over to a two-stage ejector condenser train and condensed steam is recovered back to the hot well while any air is vented to atmosphere at the after condenser. At this point, the startup ejector is normally shut off, but there are many challenges with trying to maintain a strong vacuum in the condenser. Let's look at them. Typically, the most common issue of concern is air ingress from any location within the vacuum boundary of the system. Loose piping connections, thread or flange leaks, valve packing leaks, and many other places. It can be very costly and time consuming to try and locate the specific sources of air leaks into the system. Then considering our earlier discussion, there may be wet steam issues with the mode of steam supply to the ejectors. And what about the low point drainage of those motive lines? Are there CDLs at those locations? And are they draining condensate? How about the drain traps on the inner and after condenser? Are they operating as they should? We also have to be aware that fouling of condenser tubes can occur over time due to minerals in the circulated cooling water. And speaking of cooling water, is it cool enough to condense the steam at the required rate, particularly in the hot summer months? Any of these issues can ultimately lead to a weaker vacuum in the condenser. And the usual reaction by operations is to open the hogger jet to remove air from the system. Very often we find that the problem of weaker system vacuum may be tied to the traps on the inner and after condenser. In some cases, the liquid drainer trap installed, as shown in this photo, has no balance line installed between the trap and the condenser. So the trap may become airbound and prevent condensate from draining through the trap, leading to backup of condensate in the condenser. In other cases, a steam trap with an internal thermostatic air vent is installed instead of a liquid drainer trap, allowing any air reaching the trap to pass right back through to the hot well and the main condenser. In both cases, a weaker vacuum may be the result, leading to unplanned hogger jet usage at considerable added expense. This shows the flow path through the intercondenser. Cooling water is circulated through the tubes, while the steam and air mixture from the first stage ejector enters the shell, the steam is condensed, and the air is removed by the second stage ejector to the after condenser. So by using a best practices approach, we can maximize the vacuum capability by supplying motive steam to the ejector, discharge condensed steam with a free float drain trap, and ensure proper balancing between the trap and the condenser. The after condenser design is very similar to the inner condenser, except that the condenser is at atmospheric pressure and any air removed from the vacuum system is then vented to atmosphere. Now there are basically two types of condensing turbine configurations. Those which are mounted directly on top of the surface condenser where there is no interconnecting piping between the two and those which are at or near ground level off to the side of the condenser. 
Because the turbine casing in this arrangement is usually at a low point relative to the steam flow, the turbine casing must be drained of condensate. Here it is an example of a small pedestal mounted turbine connected to the condenser by several feet of exhaust piping with a riser section in between. The inlet casing side with a high pressure steam supply has a steam trap to drain the condensate, but how can we drain the low points on the exhaust side of the turbine? Well, we might install steam traps and discharge them to atmosphere, but since we'd be draining from a vacuum pressure, there would actually be negative differential and the traps wouldn't drain, leading to condensate backup in the, both the turbine casing and the downstream piping. And the effects may be water hammer damage and weaker vacuum at the condenser. Another option might be to route the discharge of the traps to the hot well of the condenser. But here, the pressure of the turbine exhaust and the condenser hot well is virtually the same. And additionally, there is likely to be a vertical lift of a few feet to enter the hot well, increasing the back pressure at the traps. The result is that there is still negative differential at the traps, no drainage, and condensate backup as before. A better option might be to pump the condensate to the hot well using a mechanical pump such as the TLV power trap system. This animation demonstrates the features and operation of the TLV GT10, showing first how the float rises and falls to modulate the trap opening in response to condensate load and discharge condensate when positive differential pressure exists. But when there is zero or negative differential, the float rises higher and eventually trips the snap action mechanism to open the motor valve at the top and introduce steam pressure to push the condensate through the trap. Once the float re reaches the low position, the snap action mechanism trips back, closes the motor valve, and opens the exhaust valve to allow the pressure in the pump body to equalize with the inlet piping, allowing more condensate to flow into the pump. To help you size and select power traps for your vacuum steam or other condensate recovery applications, TLV has what we call a condensate recovery application form. We can send you this form. You would provide us the operating conditions of your application, and we will provide you a recommendation with important notes about that application, such as how the power trap should be installed and other related things you need to consider. Returning to our discussion of condensing turbines, if we consider that the rotor is spinning at high speed inside the turbine casing, it is obvious that some clearance must be provided for the shaft as it protrudes from the stationary casing at each end of the turbine. Now, as steam enters the high pressure end of the turbine casing, there is the potential for steam to leak out through the space between the rotating shaft and the casing. By contrast, the vacuum end of the casing would allow air to leak in, and neither of these is desirable. So to reduce leakage out or in, gland seals are located at each end of the casing. Within the gland seals are labyrinth seals, which considerably reduce the amount of leakage of steam or air. But even so, there will still be some leakage of high pressure steam through the gland seal. This leakage steam is extracted from the gland using a leak off header and is maintained at very low pressure. While some of this low pressure steam is also supplied to the gland on the vacuum end of the turbine to prevent air from leaking into the turbine. Steam leaking in at this far end is preferable to air, but there is still some potential for leakage along the shaft to the surroundings. So this steam is drawn off from the outside of both gland seals under slight vacuum to a gland steam condenser. The flow configuration of the gland steam condenser is very similar to that of the inter and after condenser previously discussed, except that the air is removed from the condenser under slight vacuum by an exhauster or blower fan. And like the after condenser previously discussed, we want to maintain vacuum strength at the turbine by removing the condensed steam with a free float drain trap 
and a proper balance line to the condenser while venting air to atmosphere through the blower fan. For more information on best practices steam and condensate piping around steam turbines, please visit the TLV.com website and watch the recording of the webinar, Common Refining and Petrochemical Steam Application Problems, part one. Next, we will move on to another steam intensive application, extruders. Many petrochemical plants produce polymers in pellet form, which they then sell to other companies who use them to produce many of the products we use in everyday life. The more common polymers produced are polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, and polyvinyl chloride or PVC. Steam pressures used are dependent on the particular polymer. Pre pressures range from as low as 100 PSIG in the barrel section to a high of about 650 PSIG at the die. The application goals are to maintain product temperature throughout the extruder, avoid freeze-ups of polymer at the die, and maintain consistent pellet quality. One of the biggest challenges involving the extrusion process is maintaining accurate and consistent product temperature. Having melt temperatures too low or too high can lead to product abnormalities such as tails, fines, gas bubbles, and color specs, to name a few. The extruder is comprised of several key components. The hopper, is where the plastic raw material is initially fed into the extruder machine and travels by gravity into the feed section of the barrel. The rotating screw mixes and compresses the plastic material, generating shear heat as it is moved forward through the barrel by the screw. The combination of shear heat and added heat from the external barrel heaters located along the length of the barrel melts the plastic. When the melted plastic reaches the end of the screw, it passes through a screen which filters out contaminants from the melt. At this point, the melt should be well mixed at the appropriate pressure and temperature for extrusion through the die. Barrel heater sections are typically supplied with steam at the same pressure to maintain heat at or above the minimum required temperature for the polymer being extruded. However, the heat duty of each section may be different depending on the temperature of the plastic in the barrel. The heaters are also drained by separate lines initially, but it is not unusual to see these lines tied together to one steam trap, an arrangement known as group trapping. This photo shows two separate drain lines tying into one steam trap. This animation shows four identical heating coils, but with different heating loads and different pressure drops. When joined together at their outlets, the balancing of these pressures may cause some coils with heavier loads to back up condensate, significantly reducing the heating capability of those coils. So individual trapping of each barrel heater using free float traps is the most effective way to ensure complete continuous drainage of condensate from the heaters and maintenance of product temperature. This graphic shows the basic flow configuration to the front end of the extruder and through the die as the plastic melt passes through the die plate holes and the resulting cut pellets are carried off in a warm water stream to be cooled and dried. The die typically has up to three steam channels with separate supply and drain connections and it is critical to avoid condensate backup in any of these channels in order to avoid potential plugging of the die holes. So the important design criteria for the die would be to supply dry steam using an engineered separator drain and to eventually drain each die channel using free float steam traps. Proper trapping of the extruder will maximize production reduce pellet variability in off-spec product, and mitigate continuous condensate blowdown at the trap stations. To help customers with proper condensate drainage of their extruder equipment, TLV uses an extruder drainage application form, 
which will allow us to collect information about the operating conditions and the current installation, and then make appropriate product recommendations for the extruder. We now move on to our next application, desuperheaters. So why is desuperheating important? Well, let's start at the boiler, where high pressure steam is generated at saturation temperature. If we want to use steam to do mechanical work, such as through turbines, with the highest efficiency possible, then we need to add more heat to the steam and raise its temperature, effectively superheating it. We can then use the steam to drive the turbines, after which some of the pressure energy of the steam has been used, resulting in lower pressure, but often still very superheated steam. We must then consider using desuperheating equipment if we want to bring the steam temperature down closer to saturation temperature within 10 to 15 degrees or so, so that we can use the latent heat of steam for process heating applications. This image shows a typical desuperheating station in a plant. So here we have superheated steam coming in from left to right through the main line. And from down below, we have a condensate uh, cooling water line with a control valve uh, regulating the flow to the top of the steam pipe where they're joined at the desuperheater and mixed. And the resulting mixed stream of steam and water becomes desuperheated steam and travels down into the plant. However, on closer examination of the station, we might find some telltale signs of potential problems such as substantially undersized traps downstream of the desuperheater, or visual evidence that the desuperheater is injecting too much water into the line. Here we have a representation of a typical desuperheating station with a pressure letdown valve at the supply side, followed by the desuperheater, pressure and temperature measurements, and a drip leg with a trap pipe to the return system. Since the trap is piped to return, we cannot see what kind of condensate load it is handling. If the system is working normally, it may be under a no load superheat condition. But if there is excessive condensate in the line, it may be having trouble keeping the steam line drained. Additionally, the temperature sensor may be installed where it cannot pick up measurements of excessive water flow, or where there has not been effective mixing of steam and water due to high flow velocities. In short, there may be no way to tell with this arrangement if there is excessive water being injected at the desuperheater, which could easily lead to piping or equipment damage downstream. A more effective superheater station would have a downstream CDL with a trap pipe to atmosphere that could give visual indication of the condensate load near the desuperheater. Also, a temperature sensor placed farther downstream at a point where effective mixing of steam and water has already occurred, and the addition of an engineered separator drain to remove any entrained moisture droplets that have not fallen to the bottom of the pipe. This combination could lead to optimal production for the plant. So the two most effective design components to help reduce water input from a desuperated line are an extended collection leg known as a condensate collection bottle, or excessive condensate flow removal, and an engineered separator drain for wet steam conditions. For more information on desuperheating and other steam quality issues, please go to our website and read the article written by Jim Risco entitled Steam Quality Considerations, published in the May 2020 edition of Chemical Engineering Magazine. It is also available in the handout section of this webinar. And with that, I will pass control over to my associate, Justin McFarlane, as he takes you through the rest of the refinery and petrochemical applications. Thank you, Tracy. That's a lot of really good, useful information. Now, at this time, we're going to talk about the major steam using equipment in the sulfur recovery unit. So if you look at an overview of the sulfur recovery process, we can see that an acid gas feed first goes through a combustion process where a large portion of that feed is converted to sulfur. The reactions that take place to convert the feed into sulfur produce a lot of heat. That heat can first then be recovered by a medium to high pressure 
waste heat boiler. So, and further recovery um, by lower pressure waste heat boilers as well. So, those lower pressure waste heat boilers also uh, condense as part of the, the, the stream to be liquid sulfur. And the remaining gas products are then sent through a series of reheaters, catalytic reactors, and sulfur condensers to extract as much liquid sulfur as possible. All of that gets transported into a sulfur pit. And any leftover gas products are then burned off at the tail gas incinerator. So the topics of our discussion in the SRU are all steam-based, meaning that these applications either consume or produce steam. So we're only going to be talking about sulfur transport network, sulfur pits, sulfur condensers, and the reheaters. We're going to get started off with jacketed piping within the sulfur transport network. The image I'm showing here is an example of jacketed piping. Molten sulfur and gas products travel through the center while steam encapsulates the center pipe. The goals here are to provide sufficient heat to the process piping in order to maintain sulfur temperature within a specified range, about 120 to 150 degrees Celsius, which that temperature range allows sulfur to be pumped. So any temperatures outside of that range can cause the sulfur to solidify or polymerize, which then makes it nearly impossible to pump the sulfur. So if that happens, it would have to undergo an extreme heating process or chemical process in order to change the viscosity back to a point where the sulfur can be pumped. So to meet these goals, we'll need to supply steam to each jacketed section and fully drain condensate to maintain even heating. However, big problem that we often encounter is the piping configuration to and from adjacent jacket sections very often lead to steam locking. So steam locking can cause condensate to back up in the steam space, which then can lead to heat losses from the process piping and possible sulfur solidification. So let's first try to understand a little bit more about steam locking. Now in an SRU, this would most commonly occur when there's vertical piping rise before the steam trap, as I've shown here. So condensate settles at the bottom of the piping while live steam is trapped at the top. The condensate can't begin moving toward the trap to be discharged until the steam gives off its heat and condenses. And after all the condensate has been discharged, the cycle starts right back over. The problem here is the trap was installed above the lowest point. And that allows steam to enter the trap before the condensate, forcing the trap to close, which then causes the condensate backup, causes heat losses in the process line, and ultimately sulfur solidification. Interestingly enough, if you were to examine the steam trap, you'd see that the trap itself is hot, making you think that it was functioning properly all while having to deal with the repercussions of a cold process line. So let's look at an example of a simple tube tracing application. You see the problem here? Now, as I mentioned before, steam locking commonly occurs in jacketed piping simply due to the piping configuration from jacket to jacket. In S loop configurations, like I'm showing here, the steam and condensate share the piping. And this causes pockets of steam to get pu pushed toward the trap, causing it to intermittently lock shut. Far too often though, when we see this type of configuration, we've found that operators are cracking unions or blowing down steam traps to maintain flow in an attempt to keep the sulfur lines hot. One way to improve the situation where the piping is already in place is to add a T at the bottom of each loop and individually drain each jacket section. Multiple drain points help to distribute the burden of draining condensate and then reduces the risk of sulfur temperature fluctuations even if one or more traps become steam locked. Our better alternative requires a bit more modification. 
So it's probably going to be a bit more difficult if the jacketed piping wasn't originally specified with four connections on each jacket section. The planning for four connections during the design phase and configuring this way allows for complete separation of the steam and condensate flows, minimizing the possibility of steam locking. An even better improvement using this type of concept is to individually drain each jacket section, which again allows for complete separation of steam and condensate flows, it also minimizes pressure losses and distributes the burden of drainage across multiple traps. Now, another type of heat transfer technology we commonly see is bolt-on channel tracing. This can be a much lower cost alternative as compared to jacket piping and can be utilized in many different custom configurations, such as with piping, valving, vessels, and tanks. And when installed with proper condensate drainage that does not steam lock, bolt-on channel tracing can provide sufficiently high heat conduction. But one such application where this type of bolt-on channel tracing can be applied outside of the SRU, is on Paris Island shoots. And in many instances, we hear sites complaining that they're getting shoot clogs many, many times throughout the year. And this happens as some shoot configurations promote stagnation near the outside walls where it gives off heat, eventually reducing the flow and clogging the chute. And in this application, we use the compact manifold station to supply steam to a custom bolt-on channel tracing circuit. This evenly distributes heat to the chute walls and is able to drain condensate without any vertical piping lifts, significantly reducing any risk of future clogging. But even with the best jacketed piping or bolt-on channel tracing configurations, additional steam lock challenges still exist. So do you remember this image? Now, as you probably guessed by now, tidying up the SRU by consolidating steam traps at a condensate collection manifold might require you to first route pre-insulated tubing up to a pipe rack. Also, any obstacles such as process equipment, barricades, or other infrastructure could also force a vertical piping lift before the steam trap. And all of this leading to steam locking. Fortunately, all hope is not lost. There are some countermeasures that can be taken to address these issues. One very common countermeasure is to open an external bypass. This bypass allows a small amount of steam to bleed past, preventing a steam lock. However, there's still a lot of room for error. Now, if this valve closes too much, there's still a possibility that the trap becomes steam locked. And if it's open too much, well, you're getting rid of the steam lock, but you're operating very inefficiently by wasting steam. And depending on the type and size of the valve, too much valve opening could cause other issues like water hammer and pressure spikes in the condensate return line. Instead, TLV prefers a fixed internal bypass. This is basically a small passage shortcut between this trap steam space and the condensate space. So when a pocket of steam enters a trap that would otherwise cause it to lock shut, steam is able to pass through the fixed internal bypass, alleviating the steam lock and allowing condensate to continue flowing to the trap. There's a lot more we can talk about steam tracing, but instead, I'm gonna ask that if you're interested, Please read this article written by Mr. Jim Risco, which goes into much more detail about heat maintenance issues with tracing systems. This article is available on our website. It can also be found in the handout section. Mr. Norm White also presented these topics in a previously recorded webinar, which can be found on our tld.com website. Our next topic is on sulfur seals. Now, sulfur seals are located in the trans sulfur transport line 
before the sulfur pit or a collection vessel. And they function by establishing a liquid seal at the bottom, trapping gases, and allowing liquid sulfur to pass through to the sulfur pit. And similar to jacketed piping, the internal process piping is encapsulated by steam. And for underground versions like I've shown here, the body of the seal can extend 20 feet underground. Now, wondering if you're seeing a problem with this. So to summarize the goals, this is designed to trap sulfur line vapors, maintain the liquid sulfur at that 120 to 150 degrees Celsius range, and discharge liquid sulfur back to the sulfur pit. As you probably guessed, vertically lifting the condensate from the bottom of the seal to the condensate outlet will inevitably cause steam locking. Now, there are above ground sulfur seals, uh, some of which are configured with bolt on channel tracing, like I've shown here, but there are still challenges. Oftentimes, there's only one steam entry, one steam exit, and the bolt on channel sections create multiple vertical rises and drops. So, whether you're using an underground sulfur seal or an above ground seal, we'll often recommend using a steam supply manifold to help supply dry steam and return the condensate to a collection manifold, which has been configured with, you guessed it, free float traps that have a fixed internal bypass. So as we look at the next points of our application of sulfur pits, Wondering if anybody's starting to see a pattern here. I'll give you a clue. Two words, steam locking. This issue is definitely a major concern in SRUs that we visited all throughout the world. So now getting into sulfur pits. The sulfur pit's main function is a temporary storage facility for molten sulfur until it can be transported out of the refinery. And just like other SRU applications we've looked at, it uses steam to keep the molten sulfur hot. The goals here are identical to the jacketed piping and the sulfur seals. And the challenges are identical as well. In each case, since condensate must be lifted vertically to the steam trap. Now, we often hear that sulfur pit coils might utilize uh, a lift fitting, like I'm showing here which is designed to keep steam at the bottom of the coil and only allow condensate to pass. Now caution that while these may help mitigate steam locking, they do not altogether prevent steam locking. So whether or not a lift fitting is installed, we will always recommend a free float steam trap with a fixed internal bypass. Now you're probably thinking this particular trap looks a little different than the other one I've shown, and you're absolutely right. It's a mechanical trap uh, and it functions nearly the exact same way with the added advantage of extra capacity. Now this extra capacity is gonna be needed due to the larger heating requirements of the sulfur pit coil. Now we're finally moving on to a slightly different topic, um, type of application, sulfur condensers that um, really not much concern for steam locking here. So, so different uh, issues, different recommendations. But functionally, these work the same way as waste heat boilers. Waste heat boilers are often found in other refinery units and petrochemical sites. Um, they're sometimes kettle type reboilers, tubes to the middle and a large vapor space above. And if we fill our condenser with boiler feed water, we can then in condense the incoming hot sulfur gas. It's just either left the combustion process or the catalytic reactors. So the heat exchanged allows for the creation of what is essentially free steam. Since the heat exchange was from a process stream instead of burning fuel like natural gas at a standard fire boiler. The main job of the condenser is to help capture elemental sulfur 
for storage and later transport. However, one common problem, probably more so common in other refinery units, is that waste heat boilers often produce very wet steam. And this occurs during sudden changes in demand for that particular steam line, such as when a steam turbine or other large steam user is turned on. So your question is, well, how do I deal with wet steam? And hopefully you're paying attention when Tracy was talking about wet steam and vacuum applications, because wet steam is going to wreak havoc on ejectors, turbines, and cause problems with erosions, and even limit performance of process heaters. So to fix this problem, we're going to want to make sure that we've got a properly sized cyclonic separator. And TLV designs the separators to have a 98% separation efficiency, meaning that if 10% of your steam flow is actually in trained water, well then the separator will help produce steam quality upwards of 99.8%. And a big part of making this function well is a properly sized high capacity steam trap. We'll typically recommend a trap with capacity of about 10% of the full design steam production capability of that waste heat boiler to make sure that condensate is quickly drained and does not back up into the separator. Our last topic of the day is reheaters. So by their name, reheaters utilize steam to reheat the sulfur gas before entering a catalyst reactor. These are sometimes vertical heaters with steam on the shell side. So adding an air vent at the top of the vapor space will dramatically help to improve startup times, as well as also improve overall heating performance by automatically discharging non-condensable vapors in the steam space. Condensate should discharge their large capacity free flow trap, as with this application, there's typically no concern for stall. Now, if you're asking yourself, well, what the heck is stall? Then I suggest that you read this article written by Mr. Jim Risco. And as I mentioned, stall should not normally be a problem within the SRU, but it is very, very common outside of the SRU, where typically lower process temperature requirements modulating steam pressures and oversurface heat exchangers combine to destroy heating performance and often make a nightmare of maintenance issues. You can also tune into part one of this series in common refining and petrochemical steam application problems where process heaters and the concept of stall is discussed in great depth. So we wanna thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions about steam system applications, our consulting engineering services group in North America can be reached by phone at 1-800-TLV-TRAP or by email at ces at tlvengineering.com. And if you're not in North America, we do have 14 global offices. So please feel free to reach out to your local TLV office to ask any questions or inquire about how TLV's Consulting Engineering Services Group can help you with your STEAM system applications. Also encourage everyone to visit our TLV.com website where you can find links to an online calculator, many technical articles, and other technical training resources, as well as this webinar recording and other recordings of other webinars that have already been conducted. I want to thank you again for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed part two in our series of refining and petrochemical plant steam application problems. I hope that you'll join us in two weeks for our next webinar, where we'll be discussing how to use TLV's trap man system to support your steam trap management program. Thank you very much. Hope you have a good day and a good weekend.